All right, the next presenter is Dr. Naidu from South Africa on e-assessments, a comparison of the grades of self-regulated versus non-self-regulated learners in an L2 module. Dr. Naidu, over to you. Sorry, can't hear you. Are you there, Dr. Naidu? Yes, I am. Sorry about that. I was on Okay, there. no worries. Okay, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining this um, session. I am going to take the discussion to e-assessment, and I'm comparing um, the grades of self-regulated and non-self-regulated learners in a second language um, module. Okay, my name is Shamila Naidu and I teach in the Basic Isi Zulu module at UKZN. Basic Isi Zulu is a second language um, module and over the last five years we have moved into a blended format. So we have face-to-face um, -face lectures, we have a written examination at the end of the semester, but our formative and summative assessments during the term are online activities. I think everybody understands that distinction between formative and summative. Formative when the chef tastes the soup and summative when the guests um, taste the soup. So that is our module, a, a blended module. We have um, online lectures as well. And um, what I want to really concentrate on is the formative activities that we have. Um, one of the reasons why we posted so much of formative activities is because ideally a second language class should consist of a small number of students. For logistical reasons, this is impossible. So we were of the opinion that um, online formative engagement would enhance the language learning experience for the, for the student. So our online formative activities take the form of um, listening comprehension activities. There are quiz activities that are linked to the content that is taught during uh, the week. So in other words, we're trying to personalize the interaction between the student and the content, but using the online um, format. Now, there are multiple advantages to online formative activity and online formative assessment. Um, feedback is um, easily obtainable, so students are more aware of their weak areas. Um, with online formative activity, you have multiple attempts that is permitted. So the student can actually monitor his or her improvement in terms of grades obtained. And then, of course, at the other end of the spectrum, we were very keen to employ formative assessment so that the student assumes responsibility for his or her learning, um, so that the student actually engages with the act of learning, and, as, and a consequence of that is the activation of self-regulation. Now, self-regulation is a very important um, concept for all learning, but it is particularly beneficial to um, language learning. Um, I am wanting to show you a little clip and I think I've just moved a bit too fast there. So I'd like you to listen to this clip and then I'm going to come back and talk a, a bit more about self-regulation. Shamila, you need to increase the volume. We can't hear it. Mm, 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 mm. Or you need to share your computer sound. Um. Uh, what you're going to do is, I would suggest if you would want to show it, you just need to stop your share. And then when you share again, 
you, when you share your screen again, you'll see there's an option to click that says share my computer sound and then the computer sound will play. So you just quickly unshare and then share your screen again. But before you choose a thing, do you select uh, share my sound as well? This is a little checkbox for that. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just, I've got my share computer sound on. Are you still not hearing it? Well, you need to play it again now, you stopped it. Oh, all right, okay. Now you've stopped your share. Right, and. This is Flora. Are you hearing and it this now? This is Tim. Perfect. Both are university students starting a new degree program. Flora and Tim have been asked to give a talk on a new topic. So they are keen to master new presentation skills. But Flora and Tim have different learning approaches to this task. Flora decides to attend a two-day seminar where an expert outlines how to benefit from appropriate and effective presentation skills. Tim, on the other hand, opts for a self-regulated learning approach. But what exactly is self-regulated learning and how does it differ from Flora's more traditional learning approach? Essentially, the distinction between the two learning approaches can be illustrated with a different, perhaps more familiar example. Tim and Flora make a trip to Rome. Flora takes a guided city tour and joins an organised group. Everyone hears the same tourist information. Nonetheless, Flora gains a good overview of Rome. But with hindsight, however, she feels that she would have been happier if she had had the opportunity to learn more about particular historical sites. On the other hand, Tim decides to plan his own individual city tour in advance. He includes adequate time for the sites, which he finds particularly interesting, in order to explore them extensively. In the evening, he reviews his sightseeing day and is delighted by the things he has learnt and experienced for himself. Tim's approach was, in fact, self-regulated learning. Self-regulated learning is about determining your own learning goals, selecting your own appropriate learning aids and actively using them for your learning. Effectively, this approach enables you to learn how to learn. Maybe you would also, like Tim, want to improve your learning skills and have fun in doing so by gaining a deeper understanding of the topic and boosting your learning process. If so, self-regulated learning could be the perfect answer for you. The role project supports the entire learning process. It offers you access to numerous tools. Okay, so um, that clip that you just watched was one version of self-regulated learning. And um, it is probably not the version that is suitable for for our circumstances in basic SE Zulu, it sees the learner in a very autonomous situation, um, the learner as constructor, as monitor, as regulator, as motivator, uh, and so forth. And that is a less than ideal situation for us in basic SE Zulu. The model of self-regulation that we subscribe to is that of OATS 2019. And, um, the important thing that um, the important part of the OATS mod model is this concept of emergent self-regulated learning. Now, what is emergent self-regulated learning? Think back to the formative activities that I spoke about um, earlier. We as teachers on the module were responsible for an intervention. We are providing the formative um, activities for students. Um, we are providing explicit instruction. In other words, we are fostering um, the concept of self-regulation in our students. And um, that is the whole point of our exercises that we actually want to sort of ignite this concept of self-regulated learning. Well, at the end of 2019, we um, conducted a survey with our students and it was mainly to um, elicit their attitudes on the e-component of the blended learning format. So it was um, a very general 
uh, online survey with 30 statements that de dealt with various aspects of e-learning. And then there were statements um, included on self-regulation. Statements like, um, I only attempted the online tasks before a test. I had a regular routine. I completed all the quiz exercises. This was just supposed to be for our benefit. Well, we were astounded at the results. Only 32% of our cohort completed all the formative activities. Only 29% had a regular routine. And lo and behold, 47% of our cohort only attempted the formative activities before a test. Needless to say, we were, we were very disappointed. Um, the jury has, all, has been out for a very long time on, on this idea of whether formative assessment actually has um, any measurable impact on summative scores. Um, there are two schools of thought. Um, I've, uh, I've got the references here, but Cassidy and Gridley 2005 claim there is a small but positive impact. Admiral LL claim there's a weak relationship. Mitra and Barua, there's a trivial but positive re relationship. And Nagantla et al. 2018 feel that there is no significant difference in the summative marks of learners who completed OFAs and those who did not. And on the other side there, you've got all the, um, the, the people who actually believe or, or whose research results uh, indicate that there is a positive impact. So we decided- Can I get three we, minutes, Rock and I do? Three okay, minutes. Okay, thank you. We decided to compare um, the results of self-regulated and non-self-regulated students. Um, I'm going to go through this very quickly. We did this, and by, when I refer to self-regulated students, I'm talking about those who completed um, the formative activities. We looked at their summative, the scores from summative assessments, from formative assessments, and from written assessments. Um, statistical procedures were conducted on the results. We had 163 participants, um, 131 were self-regulated, and 32 were not self-regulated, meaning they didn't attempt any activities. Um, I'm going to skip immediately to the results. Uh, we broke down, I'm, I'm reporting on a small section of the survey. Now, the minimum grade um, obtained was for the, for the self-regulated students was 42.5% and for the non-self-regulated, 24. That was in the summative assessment and you can see the exam scores there. <coughs> The mean grades, this is the important one. In the summative assessments, you can see that our self-regulated students obtained 61.4%, but our non-self-regulated 48%. 62 in the written exam, 41 in, uh, for the non-self-regulated students. But look at the maximum grades. Those that you look at the orange block, those are our non-self-regulated students, you can see that they are, without doing any of the formative activities, they're still capable of obtaining high scores um, in certain tests. Let me skip that and look at the results from the R scores. Now there is a strong correlation between engaging in formative assessment and, um, and its impact on summative scores. There is also a strong correlation between engaging in the summative assessments and the exam scores. So I will skip the reasons that may come up in questions, but for us in basic Isizulu, formative assessment is a strategy to encourage self-regulation and our findings are that students who self-regulate and engage in formative assessment record better academic grades at the end of the module. Thank you. So uh, good morning, everyone. So I am uh, uh, Vandana from Open University.
Vatishas, and uh, I did this paper jointly by Dr. Singh uh, from UKZN, and our topic is basically on the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on academics at the Mauritian Higher Education Institution. So uh, uh, my structure uh, of this uh, presentation, it would be, you know, I can't move ahead without presenting my country itself, so I will start with the presentation of my country background of the study, objectives and significance of the study, research question and design, literature, findings, limitations, future research and conclusion. So uh, as you can see, there is a red, a red dot here. So Mauritius is here. It is a very small island with only 1.3 million populations. So uh, it is a well-known island for its cultural diversity, white sign, as you could know, uh, uh, Professor Sid. So uh, we have an evergreen, you know, island here, nice beaches, white sand and so on. So let's, let before I uh, go to the presentation, I have to make, uh, make you know about the background of COVID-19 and what has been the impact on education. So COVID-19, you know, initially identified in Wuhan, you know, in China in December 19. And it affected, you know, uh, Asia, Europe, and more countries around the world. And eventually, it's affect every sector around the world. So basically, one of them is the educational sector. So you will find that it's it started within two days or three days or more than that. It's just go on, you know, uh, affecting the education system, everybody. So you will find that from 22 countries, it goes to 73 countries. 202 countries, 192 countries was being affected and students have to stay at home. So you will find also the world student population being affected from, you know, the day one, 50 percent to 99 percent, you know, uh, until mid-April. Good. So uh, uh, my, basically, my objectives of the research is going to investigate the general impact of the pandemic on academics, to understand academics' preferences of technology to support online teaching during the uh, COVID-19, and to determine, you know, academic experience with a sudden shift to work from home. So the significance of this study is really to contribute to the development of teaching and learning in the virtual conditions, and this is going to help uh, assist the HEI, higher education institution, in the development of future educational plan or their strategies. And also it's going to lead HEI into adopting a kind of a more blended learning uh, uh, for post-COVID-19. So my research questions are, what were the immediate actions and technologies being adopted by HEI and academy during the COVID-19? And what are the general impact really on uh, the several, you know, HEIs in Mauritius and their academics? And what has been really the experience of academics who work from home during COVID-19? So when we go back to the literature review, we'll find that uh, as, as Professor uh, Craig just said, technology plays really a vital role. So during this social disconnection, the only means was technology and internet. So this was the major, you know, uh, result uh, of the solution to get through our learners. So uh, according to that, you will according to research, you find that technology really plays an important role in the transition to going more online learning. So according to research also, you will find that the use of digital platforms really promotes communication, interactions, learning, and make students more smarter, as you can see from Peter 2013 there. And the choice of an effective educational technology uh, infrastructure is really important to bridge the gap the gap, sorry, between a uh, student, the university, and academics. So it should, you know, uh, embed, you know, like the social synergy, motivated learning environment, make students more active rather than only a recipient of information. So what was really my theoretical background that I incurred, you know, within this study is self-determination theory, which was uh, developed, formulated by uh, Desai and Ryan 2008. Mm -hmm. And here you will find that academics has really initiated some social act academics activities that be used to challenge themselves in order to develop the autonomy and relatedness among university students. 
students. And that created satisfactions from our students. So what was the design that we formulated to do this study? We uh, really focused on academics from the higher education institution, private and public. We did an online survey within uh, for a full period, for a period of of four weeks during lockdowns, and we channel our uh, survey to the head of the department, the director, and they themselves, you know, channel back to their academics uh, and so on. And ethical clearance was obtained from all the HEIs that was involved, and quantitative techniques was being applied in order to do the analysis. And we uh, uh, we get a sample of twenty one academics across only four HEI in Mauritius. So what were the findings? You will find here that basically the major response come from uh, males with 52% aged from uh, 31 to 40. We got only 21 responses, four from the private uh, institution, 17 from the public institution. So all respondents nearly had a postgraduate degree. The, uh, the maximum, you know, highest participation rates come normally from the lecturers. And you will notice that here that only eight participants have experience in academ academics for more than 10 years here. So what were our findings? So we can't, you know, uh, skip that part. What has been happening uh, prior to COVID for our teaching methods and what has been going on during COVID and so on. So you will find here there has been a shift from face-to-face -face learning with 85.7% and blended learning prior to COVID to completely 100% to online learning during COVID. So during, you will find there is also a notable, notable, sorry, increase in the adoptions of blended learning with 57% during this crisis. So we'll, you will find here in the next diagram from a chi-square test that we, we did, there was a significant of respondent with 76% perceived that, you know, institution in Mauritius should adopt blended learning in the post-COVID uh, pandemic. So let's... Let's move on to the teaching tools that was being commonly adopted by academics. You will find here uh, prior to uh, the pandemic, 67% used WhatsApp and Google with 52% and Moodle 42%. Whereas during the COVID-19, Zoom and Google topped among the list with 76% each of them. So you will find that Zoom in fact was uh, basically invisible prior to uh, COVID. Now with COVID, you will find that it really topped among the list uh, in the context of education. So now let's let's move on to the Mauritian academic perceptions of challenges faced by students in moving online. So. Basically, the ones, uh, the one that most you know emerge, uh, uh, based from the uh, perceptions of the academics. So you will find that there is a kind of a lack of motivation from the student side, with fifty-seven percent access to the devices, access to internet connections, which means that the technical and access a problem was really significant with 43% each, whereas the social and emotional factors were less uh, significant. You will find here also there is a quite a demotivating uh, factor there from the part of the student, whereas uh, uh, academics were motivated in this kind of a new paradigm shift to online teaching. And when you move to the next uh, the diagram here, you will find that the top method that, uh, you know, academics used to support their students were really uh, lectures, you know, online lectures, tutoring, emailing, even phone, because there was no other options like these, you know, methods that should be adopted during COVID and so on. So what has been the challenges with forced work from home scenario? You will find that the predominant, you know, uh, challenges faced by academics in the forced work from home during the lockdown was basically social isolation with 43%, physical work space with 35%, and there is also, you know, the fear 
about the unknown virus, which is 33%. There was also a kind of a domestic, you know, hurdles and stress that, you know, recur during that working from home. So HEI were forced to, you know, uh, embrace uh, teleworking at breakneck speed, you know, uh, without any uh, thinking about the implications on academics. So uh, we, we asked also a question about the duration. How could you sustain a working from home? You will find that on uh, thirty-three percent, around thirty-three percent of academics are comfortable with this working from home arrangement. Okay. So uh, let me uh, conclude what we, uh, we we discovered, you know, and what has been the impact. So there was a certain social disconnections from uh, everybody, you know, the students, the university, the academics, and so on. So we rely fully on technology shifting online. We adopted, you know, HEI quickly. Even my university adopted a new educational product protocols in one day. Within one day, in a very short period of time, we had we had to continue sustain the teaching and learning environment for our students. So uh, basically, what has happened? There was a lack of interaction. Demotivated students be about the unknown. Although there was a kind of a, some kind of excitement from the online, you know, with the online learning so academics you know uh, really you know support and uh, it's not only academic the supporting staff also you know adopted this uh, teleworking immediately and the concept of work from home was, was really a great concern for our, our academics since a social isolation was there lack of conducive conducive physical work uh, space, sorry, was uh, missing there. And there was an anxiety about the unknown and me, uh, COVID-19. So what is the future stand of HEI? Is uh, really to adopt blended learning in the post uh, uh, COVID-19. So you will find that here, academics change uh, really the teaching and assessment you know, uh, strategies. This has been the impact. HEI was uh, really under pressure of, you know, uh, just uh, moving, how to move ahead with uh, uh, sustaining that online teaching. They have to delay their exams, you know, changing their flexible mode of, uh, of assessment instead of having face-to-face -face exams. There should be a, 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 some kind of online discussion where you assess them and so on. This has been the impact on the HEI uh, universities and some of the students have to make their own research which they did not do that, you know, uh, before. It was always about sport feeding. Now they, they, they have some kind of a link with all the lecturers during COVID where they recourse to um, uh, open educational resources and eventually to MOOCs and YouTube and so on. And for the university, there was a loss of foreign students eventually. And you will find that this uh, uh, COVID-19 has really created, you know, until university into more extensive con competition. You will find that only prestigious univers universities or institutions are likely to capture, you know, maximum market share from, you know, the student and so on. And there has been, you know, a, a radical change of business model when we put it into the context of education. So limitations that was collected during, uh, you know, uh, lockdown, and it was not easy to reach those, you know, uh, academics uh, since they were busy themselves with, you know, uh, uh, adapting, you know, to the online teaching, uh, coaching their students and so on. Despite several requests, uh, extension for participation rate, uh, the response was rate with only 21, but the Results prove very interesting and insightful for uh, the teaching and learning, you know, uh, environment. And but we cannot project, you know, this uh, uh, general this uh, result to the general academic population due to this uh, small size uh, that we receive. So future research, maybe we can investigate the impact on the of the transition of online environment on Mauritian students and eventually the administrative staff, and we can more focus on life. Uh, you know, experience of Mauritian academics in the transitions of online uh, environment, its sustainability post-COVID and the lessons that we, we really have through more qualitative, you know, approach from the work from home approach. Please.
I think this is my uh, uh, and this, these are the reference that I used, you know, for uh, that we use, you know, for this uh, study. And I would like to maybe I, I was it was quite a rush, but uh, thank you all for your attention. Thank you. All right. So greetings once again. And through the magic of the internet, um, I'm connecting to you from uh, Ballarat in Australia. The focus of my paper and my presentation is on engagement. Engagement is the superhero in learning and teaching as far as I'm concerned. It's about building relationships and, and engaging with your students and students engaging with other students. Um, and that's how effective learning happens. Um, and my work is very much based on understanding, taking the, the knowledge from neuroscience on how the brain learns and translating that into the pedagogy that, that I talk about. Okay, so let's get going. I'm going to show you a slide in a moment and I want you to read out loud the text inside the triangle. Just give you a few minutes to read it out. Right. More than likely, you said, a bird in the bush. But let's have a look at it again. A bird in the, the bush. Now, most people, when you do this little activity, miss the second B. I don't know how you went. Maybe I can get some feedback at the end. Um, so this highlights the importance of getting the learner's attention quickly, so they are alert, engaged, and ready to learn. Let's have a look at this image. What do you notice about this reflection? I'll give you a few minutes, you'll each interpret it in different ways. But for me, it is a reminder that how well my students learn is a reflection of how effectively I teach. Now, I selected these activities to illustrate the importance of achieving immediate engagement, especially in a digital environment. But it's true of face to face as well. It's always very important right at the start that you have something where the students have got to respond, they've got to react to, they've got to give you feedback. And that's where Craig's presentation was so brilliant this morning because he was talking about you know, all the different ways that you get students involved and participating in it. Now, over the years, I've developed numerous uh, tangible artifacts to try and get people actively involved. Um, over here on the left, um, I had funding to develop a, um, um, a leadership framework, which I ended up calling the um, engaging leadership framework. And I developed a pinwheel, which talked about you know, the importance of the ele key elements of leadership um, underpinned by quality assurance uh, framework. Um, here, this little activity, I would take pages from a, a colouring book or any sort of book and, and students would be required to put them in order. And that was giving them clues. You now you could get students to um, understand the order of processes or if they were studying the digestive system, um, how the flow through there. I developed a change compass to help teams understand the various phases that they might go. So they might be in a very complacent phase or a confused phase or a, 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 a phase of complete denial. This is really relevant right now. And these, this compass helped the teams work through, you know, what to expect, how to deal with the various changes. And also you know, made great big giant jigsaw puzzles, which were linked to, to quizzes. So there's some of the learning artifacts. Um, a lot of my work has been um, focusing on developing teachers who work in higher education, universities and TAFEs to become better teachers. And here there are artifacts that they developed where the challenge was you had to think about your teaching and your learning and what was really important to you. So in this particular one it was a thirst, the hunger for learning. In this particular one, the student wanted to, to understand that they needed to be really flexible. This one, empowerment, 
And this one was all about, you know, the move to online e-learning, digital learning. Um, so digital learning, while it presents many challenges, it also offers some wonderful opportunities. And once again, Craig engaged with us there today and gave us uh, some wonderful samples. You know, you can have students create videos, they can make PowerPoints, and there's lots of games that are available to, so students can practice, 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 so that they can really master the skill. Wackerbone is a great one for nursing and medical students. It's, it's just basically they have to click on the game and put the, the bones in the right parts of the body and it's timed and, and they get faster and faster at recognising the difference between the humerus and the ulnar and the tibia, etc. Um, digital journals, various apps, ensuring that you, you utilise your learning management system to communicate well with your students. And another fun activity I do with students is um, create, have them create digital posters using Glogster or some similar um, um, app or tool. Um, Kahoot is another wonderful program. We haven't time to play a game, but you can use polls, quizzes, true and false scenarios, create word clouds. You can use this for diagnostic um, assessment so that you can gauge well, what, what are the students' experiences, the learners' experiences, what knowledge base do they have, for formative, how well are you teaching, are they, how well are they learning what you're talking, for summative, uh, for review, for practice and for mastery. Um, now my paper is divided into three sections. It provides um, an overview of contemporary learning and teaching and pedagogy. It focuses on theories where, which promote engagement and draws on neuroscience to strengthen the case for engagement. And as a part of that, um, my work, I've developed a framework for digital learning and teaching informed by neuroscience. So it's based on how learning occurs in the brain. And here's the framework. So it starts with the, the information coming in, the sensory stimulation into the short term memory and through. I'll just talk you through it really briefly. So the sensory stimulation, it can be visual. So that's we get that through images, cartoons, animations, photographs, all the things that you can show using digital teaching. Auditory, talking, reading aloud is, is very effective and surprisingly much more effective than just having students read silently. Poetry, questioning, sing, singing, discussion groups, and then the tactile, which I'm really very involved in, and interested in, um, where actually people handle, um, make their own um, Art, learning artifacts and they're handling and working with models, they're drawing, they're painting. So we, we heard a little bit about uh, barriers, but that's really important. The sensory information will not pr progress into the brain and be processed by the brain if the barriers and particularly the, uh, 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 the amygdala stops or blocks the information. And this occurs if the learner is really stressed if they're frustrated, if they're bored, learning is not challenging enough. And we've all experienced this, you know, where we, we sometimes call it writer's block. I've certainly been walked into an exam and I thought, I don't know anything. And I have to really take, so that's, you know, where the amygdala kicked in and blocked the information going through, take some deep breaths and think this through. So we have to try and learn to minimize these. So we have to avoid setting tasks that are too difficult because the student will look at the task and say, well, I have no idea where to even start. And on the contrary, avoid setting tasks that are not challenging enough. Um, and it's important to minimize unnecessary stresses. So don't go in and say, oh, we're gonna have an exam at the end of the day. Or, um, well, I just read all your papers and I'm very disappointed or with, You've got to try and minimise the stresses. If students are learning at home, try and get them to find, and this is not always possible, but a quiet place and a, and a quiet time so that they can engage in their work. Um, it is essential to gain learners' attention quickly. Um, as much as possible, try and connect to the learners' prior knowledge and experience because that will get them engaged. Um, 
I can remember, you know, setting a task where the students had to analyze how you would learn a particular skill. Um, Lorraine, I, three minutes. Oh, really? Right, thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, and how, how they would learn a particular skill. And that meant that they had to, they could choose their own skill. Now, here's the brain friendly, here's the good stuff. It's important. Um, these are the enablers or the brain friendly learning strategies being active, being read to, listening to music, ensuring there's positive interaction, choice, um, choice, a sense of achievement that's very important, um, setting achievable tasks, uh, ensuring you've got fun and humour in, in your learning activities. Review and practice, review and practice. Um, we've got to achieve the mastery and giving instant feedback. Here are some examples of tangible, active, uh, tangible artifacts I've developed to help students with this. Now quickly looking through then um, what this means for online. Create positive emotional and physical online environments as much, much as possible. Design relatable and enjoyable activities provide sequential and attainable tasks, strive for mastery. I am a fan of saying, you know, pass rates should be almost 100%, because if you've got 50% and you say, oh, that's good enough, you can go up to the next level, that's 50% of the knowledge that you haven't learned and that you don't know. So you're setting yourself up for failure. The next, so strive for mastery, practice, practice, practice. And as a teacher, provide specific feedback. Don't just say, well done. Say, well done. I really like the way you used your ref. You, you referred to references. Or you could have improved this if you'd have focused on some case studies as examples. Um, encourage group work and peer learning. Celebrate achievements. The brain gives a kick of dopamine when people say, wow, look, I didn't think I could do that, but I've now I've mastered it provide opportunities for creative activities, engagement in music, art, dance, acting, and try and combine those. Include physical activities. There's a lot of evidence about the huge benefits of physical activity on cognitive learning and stress the importance of sleep and rest. We need the sleep and rest because that's when the memories get laid down, the learning occurs. Now a message for educational leaders, decision makers and curriculum designers, Digital learning and teaching should not be driven by technology, but instead draw upon selected te technologies which support the learning concepts informed by neuroscience outlined in this framework. In other words, that support the pe pedagogy. And of course, the su success of this approach is contingent upon time and resources allocated to staff development. That's a very critical one. And strategies to support student use of digital learning. So thank you. I hope you're now motivated to read my paper. Um, if you want to make any further contact, there I am. Um, I have established a consultant here for professional development called NeuroSmart, where I help um, teachers in, in primarily higher education environments um, improve their interaction and engagement with students. Thank you. So actually, uh, there's a change in the title. It's a uh, learning management system for secondary schooling. And uh, the name of the LMS that uh, we developed is uh, Morilearn. Okay, so Mauritius and Learn. We combine both together. We have Morilearn. This is the platform we designed. And uh, the group of researcher has uh, myself. Okay, uh, I am uh, an information technology uh, lecturer at the University of Technology, Mauritius. And also I work at uh, Amity, Mauritius. So two universities, and I'm also a researcher. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have my colleagues with me today. Uh, Dr. Vinayam Gum, who is the head of engineering at uh, UTM. And uh, I have uh, Dr. Pavo, who is the head of research at the University, Open University of Mauritius. Unfortunately, they are not here today with us. Uh, so uh, basically just have, uh, let's have an overview on the COVID-19 situation. It's been a very hard year for uh, all of us. 
And uh, those are the new numbers I just look at uh, today uh, on statistics uh, for uh, health organization. And we have 63 million of confirmed cases so far. And uh, unfortunately, we have 1.4 million of deaths and uh, 220 countries being affected with this pandemic. This is very, very hard on us. And let's hope, let's pray together that uh, hopefully we have now the solution, the vaccines. And the uh, UK is already uh, doing the vaccine, so let's pray. And uh, we say that the next year coming, okay, we are free from this COVID-19 situation. And this is uh, actually the problem we face in Mauritius. And then we come forward with a learning management system. Uh, this is also some fact uh, from uh, the UNESCO uh, Institute of Statistics, uh, how the COVID-19 has affected worldwide all education uh, institutions. We have around 188 countries being affected with 1.5 billion of students not going to school and 63 million of teachers okay, uh, at home and, and trying to work, trying to deliver learning uh, materials to those 1.5 billion of students. Mauritius, unfortunately, uh, we, are, we are a country providing free education to some around 85 primary students, 108 secondary students, and 15,000 tertiary students. And uh, during the COVID uh, situation where we, we uh, had unfortunately 10 deaths, uh, it was declared a, a lockdown in the country in March 2020, where all academic institutions were forced to close. And this has affected the education system in Mauritius. Most secondary schools in the country were either forced to close and not conducting any online lecture. Some secondary schools in the country moved to collaboration tools such as Skype, Zoom, or WhatsApp. And even then, okay, they was not able to have one week of additional continuous uh, learning on those co collaboration tools like Skype or, or Zoom or, or WhatsApp. And then we say, okay, we need to come forward with a solution to help all the students, all those teachers to, to be able to have their learning experience. And um, the lockdown was around four to five months. And uh, this is very heavy in the academic year. So we say, okay, we have to design a platform to be able to assist those students in their learning development. Uh, but before uh, going into the learning uh, platform that we developed, uh, we wanted to stress out some uh, disadvantages with collaboration tools. Okay, uh, those collaboration tools like Skype, WhatsApp, or even Zoom, they are more business meeting oriented platform. So they don't have all the features or the requirement to support the proper learning development of a student. They are here and they help us, they help Mauritius a lot. And I think a lot of countries use them in their education system as well. It was like the first tool to make use of, to be able to, of course, help our students. But still, they do have some features that is not really appropriate for the learning development of students. And the solution, of course, is a learning management system. It is an information system, a platform, it can be web-based, can be a software, you just download it, use it. So it is an information system and it has all the functional requirements to, to properly plan, assess, evaluate the student's learning progress. I know a lot of uh, secondary teachers uh, came to, to UTM and uh, informed us that we are using WhatsApp, but how are we going to conduct online tests, online quiz on, on WhatsApp? This was the major issue of online assessment using collaboration tools. And then the team comprising of me and uh, Dr. Amugum and Dr. Uh, Pavo, we designed a platform tailored made for Mauritius secondary schools. Okay, it's called MoriLearn, so Mauritius and Learn. We just uh, put them together. We have a platform MoriLearn, which is a free rapid solution we developed for secondary schools in Mauritius. And uh, the programming language we use to develop uh, this platform is using Python and MySQL. So Python, this is uh, the programming language uh, a lot of researchers are using to develop our application, but also the aim behind uh, of using Python is we are going to add some artificial intelligence framework later in this platform to make it become a smart LMS where we help as well some teachers to do their job more efficiently using smart application. So this is the aim why we use Python and not other programming language, okay? because it's easier to, to have AI 
uh, incorporated in uh, Python. So this uh, website, www.murillion.com, is a free uh, website where you can have access to it. And uh, basically, it is optimized for Mauritius, based on Mauritius education system for secondary schools, where uh, all classes are based on the grading system. And uh, it, is, uh, it is optimized for secondary schools. So it is free. Everybody can have access to it. You just have to create an account for that. And I am uh, currently the admin. So if uh, all our colleagues here present, if they want to join uh, on the Morillon, just drop me a little mail. I'll create an account for you and you have free access to uh, the website. You can use it. But uh, keep in mind, it's optimized for Mauritius system. Now, some of the features of Morillon, uh, we had to develop this platform first to be able to send it into schools for the students and teachers to use. So we use only the core requirements, the core features of a learning management system that we built and we incorporated in a Morillon platform. So as a school administrator, like the admins of a school, they are able to manage all transactions onto the platform. They will manage, create the students, their password, their login, create similar thing for the teachers. And very importantly, they are able to customize the LMS according to school and logo. We later see that this is a major advantage we have with a platform that encourage a lot of students to come and use the platform for their learning process. Uh, one big issue uh, when going online is the student motivation. We found that a lot of students was not really motivated to use collaboration tool, or they're just logging on, on, on Skype with the video off and they are not here in the class virtually. So they are doing their other jobs and the teacher is just explaining that the students are not here. So we found there's a lot of uh, lack of motivation while using collaboration tools. And uh, the advantage of using Morillon is when we personalize, when we customize the application for a school with a name and logo, we see that the students were very happy and motivated now to come and to do their online lectures and classes. Features for the teacher, okay, the teacher has more privilege onto the platform, the teacher will be able to create the different chapters and uh, for Mauritius it depends on the grading system, a new system that we have just uh, incorporated in the education system. The teacher will be able to upload all learning resources including videos, documents, homework, links to other as well, create internal quiz and this solves a lot of issue that initially we had with uh, collaboration tools. So here, the students will be able to attempt internal assessments, get the marks as well. And of course, after the successful completion of a chapter, the student will get a digital certificate that is, of course, being approved by the teacher. Here you have uh, the different functions, uh, features uh, for the student. The student will be able to look at his profile page together with all the statistics like how many courses you have to enroll, how many chapters are yet to be completed, uh, how many homeworks is there and you have not completed to so a very static uh, page, but also with a very proper learning path now. For instance, you have uh, mathematics, you have all the different chapters related with mathematics plugged in the learning path of a student and the student will be able to follow stepwise all the different chapters with all the learning resources in uh, the chapters. And of course, uh, attempt of the each uh, chapter, a student will be able to attempt an internal quiz that will be created by the teacher. So this is a big model, the big overview of how the learning management system Morlin works. And uh, this, will, this is uh, more explained in uh, detail, technical detail in the research paper. So I encourage all my colleagues here to please read the paper. Uh, Dr. Sharma, three minutes. Yes, thank you, Professor. Now, uh, the platform, since it's a, a prototype version we developed initially, so we launched it as a club beta test with a pool of students and teachers from primary, uh, sorry, from secondary private institution, because the process of having the government on board to launch the platform initially was a little lengthy and we wanted to accelerate uh, the steps. So we perform a closed beta test with uh, private institutions. So a uh, pool of students and teachers and the result, interview result that we obtain, okay, most of the teachers and the students say that it is a more customized platform where they can easily do all their job, learning job, of course, more easily. And 
now we could address this issue of internal assessment. So on collaboration tool on WhatsApp, it's very difficult how to do a quiz on that, but using Borelian was able to solve this issue of uh, internal assessment. And also the students were very motivated using a platform that is designed for Mauritius. So here in Mauritius, we have a concept called Made in Morris, which is uh, promoting and encouraging uh, Mauritians to create product, to create services for the local people and uh, why the, the, the teachers and the students were using the platform, the very idea to this concept and feel very motivated to come in class to do the lectures and the classes. Uh, now, uh, this, uh, I developed this application uh, in the month of April. And uh, so far, the application is now testing in advanced testing mode with the authorities. And hopefully if everything uh, goes fine, uh, we'll expand it to more uh, schools. So not only private one, but also the government schools for them to use the application. And I must point out now that even if you are free of COVID, we are COVID free in Mauritius, this platform will act as blending uh, mode when uh, tomorrow, we don't hope so, but tomorrow if happen uh, uh, epidemics, pandemics, uh, we know we are safe. We have such type of LMS here. So we can uh, at any time move to uh, virtual solutions and uh, taking in mind that Mauritius is a tropical island, so uh, we have a lot of uh, foreign, sorry, we have a lot of torrential rains, and it may happen that sometimes two days, three days, the students do not get to school because of a heavy rainfall. So now we know we have such type of platform available for them. They just have to log in and they have access to all their learning resources. So future work that now we are trying to implement uh, into the Morillon AMS is to have uh, teleconferencing like we are using right at the moment, where we can have the teachers talking with the students, also bulk email transactions, so all transactions now just happen through email onto the platform. We have a live chat system, and also we are going to incorporate some AI framework into the uh, LMS to make it a smart learning management information system. Well, thank you, that's, that's all for me. All right. Thank you so much. And then good morning to everyone again. And thanks to all the presenters so far for the exciting and then engage engagement uh, presentation. Uh, for myself and then uh, my colleagues from Namibia, I'm making a presentation on our paper on uh, student awareness and then perception of uh, open educational resources, the case study of the International University of Management uh, in Namibia. I'm presenting on behalf of uh, Lucy Kiana. Uh, and Acton Liberia, she's the second person in this photograph, the list of photographs you see. Lucy Kiana, she's an Acton Liberian at the International University of Management. And then on behalf of uh, Gloria Ayawa, she's a senior lecturer from the Un uh, Namibian University of Science and Technology. Uh, also Dr. Osakwe Jude, a senior lecturer at the Namibian University of Science and Technology. And then uh, Professor King Chombo, an advisor to the University Council in the uh, at the International University of Management. Uh, the presentation is divided into four sections, uh, problem and motivation, aim and research methodology, then our research outcomes and then conclusion. Uh, existing literature indicate that open educational resources are beneficial in several ways. Among them include this that uh, some uh, uh, authors have indicated in the past. Uh, according to Grimaldi, uh, he said that uh, open educational resources uh, improves the quality of teaching. Uh, he also indicated that it reduces the economic and then geographical barriers of uh, uh, education. And Wright and Ruju indicated that it increases the opportunity to access educational materials anywhere, anytime. However, there are other researchers who indicate the challenges of uh, open educational resources. And one prominent one is uh, Ingiwa and then Wilson. They indicated that there are technological issues, like uh, in the last presentation we had, one of the uh, persons who asked the questions indicated a child, uh, access, access challenge that uh, students in secondary schools could be having in uh, Mauritius. So he indicated there could be technological uh, issues. Then also there are challenges of institutional or national issues. Also maybe has to do with infrastructure 
uh, as well. And then there are social, uh, cultural, and then uh, economic uh, issues as well. Uh, another researcher who mentioned challenges of OERs is uh, Ishmael and then uh, his colleagues in 2019, who indicated that uh, awareness of OER seems to act is low. They also indicated there is a limitation of ICT infrastructure in institutions. They also indicated the need to build academics capacity on OER integration. And then they indicated the hindrance of a low OER uh, adoption. Based on the said challenges, uh, what uh, based on those the said challenges I've mentioned, we notice together with my colleagues, we notice the need to probe further into the awareness and then a perception of OERs, especially in Namibia, considering that not much studies have been carried out on OERs in Namibia to show the awareness and then perception of students on OERs. So the aim of this study, our study was to establish the awareness and perception of students so on OERs. Uh, we applied a quantitative method to collect data from some master's degree students at the International University of uh, Management in Namibia. And then we applied a convenience sample and to collect data from 80 students. And then uh, we used the questionnaire instrument to collect the data. Ethical issues were considered and then ethical clearance granted by the International University of Management uh, Research Ethics uh, Committee. In terms of our findings, uh, the age bracket wanted to be sure we're not, there are a few students in the university who are below 18 years, wanted to be sure we're not collecting data from students below 18 years because of legal issues or maybe getting uh, seeking permission from their parents, which we couldn't do in this period. So to be sure, we had to check the age bracket. So the ages, those who responded, all of them were aged from 18. But there were people, a few people who were above uh, 60. Okay, zero, nobody above 60 years from the respondents we had. There were two categories of age groups in terms of the respondents. There were people aged between 26 to 35 years and then 36 to 45 years. And then in terms of gender, there were more female uh, respondents. And then in terms of uh, the different qualifications, in terms of the master's group of students who responded, there were respondents from IT, respondents from tourism, and the respondents from MBA. For the MBA, they were from different uh, specializations, human resource management, and then uh, finance. In terms of uh, the students' awareness of uh, the licenses of OER, since OERs have different categories of licenses, about four different types, recombined into about six different types. Majority of them indicated they were aware about the licensing and hence they could use the OERs per the various licenses. Then in terms of uh, the reciprocities where they take or use OERs from, the reason for us check uh, probing further into this was for us to be to, to check whether universities were repurposing OERs for their uh, specific needs or they were just using them the way they were, the way they, they got them. So we asked students, we asked the students to find out whether they were getting OERs from specific uh, university reciprocities. And then the indication shows that uh, most of them were getting them from general sources and not specific uh, university reciprocities. Uh, in terms of uh, the usefulness, most of the students indicated, about 96% of them indicated OERs were useful to their studies only 4% indicated it wasn't useful to them. Then in terms of the search engines or where they assess OERs from, most of them indicated they get them from general purpose search engines. Uh, apart from the general search purpose engines, quite a number of them also indicated that it, they got, it was based on recommendations from their lecturers and the library staff. Then in terms of uh, OER issues of concern, uh, and then intention to share and create OERs. Most of the respondents uh, indicated that the, the major concern most had, though that was a bit uh, strange to us as the researchers, but because we didn't do a qualitative, we couldn't follow up on that. Most of them indicated the problem which it had to do with with uh, most OERs written in the English language and not translated into other languages. But at their level, the, the master's level, we're wondering why English could be an issue. Possibly there could be a problem with maybe the way that, the way we phrase questions around getting this, but we couldn't do follow up because we didn't do a qualitative thing to uh, do a follow up. So we couldn't verify, maybe in future research we may follow up to find out why 
we got that particular response. Then uh, most others had issues with uh, quality and then uh, validity. Again, we couldn't probe into, we couldn't probe further into why we got that response as well. Then in terms of sharing, majority of the students indicated they do share OERs. Then in terms of uh, creating OERs in the future, majority of the students indicated they would actually create OERs in future, considering the benefits that they've benefited from OERs. Uh, in conclusion, what we found out that uh, OER's awareness among students in the, at the International University of Management in Namibia was high. And then the students also saw OER's as useful materials and they had a good perception of it. Students, we also realized that student, uh, most students assess OER's mostly from general, uh, general search engines. Uh, however, because uh, OER's could be uh, retailed or repurposed, for specific uh, universities, we recommended that universities or colleges set up their personalized sites so as to tailor make materials on OERs to fit their own purposes. Thank you. Questions and answers. Uh, questions are welcome.